Okay. Um, I guess Downward Spiral uh, debuted at number two on the Billboard chart, um, which is not exactly something you've been dreaming about, apparently. Uh, nevertheless, Nine Inch Nails is a big success. Um, how, how are you handling this? Um, I recently feel like I'm pretty much in, have come to terms with things. And I mean that through the fact that we're on a record label now that allows me to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I went through a phase of being kind of freaked out about people liking the band, or a lot of people liking the band. And I've never imagined that we'd be in the top 30, let alone top two of the charts. But um, knowing that I did what I wanted to do, and knowing that it's on my own terms, it doesn't bother me. I mean, I, I still don't think we belong there. And when you look at the bands around us, like Ace of Bass and those kind of bands, mm -hmm. names, I don't know, it's, it's kind of cool. I'm flattered that it, it made it that high, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm just become numb to it. And I, I know that I did it on my own terms, so I don't feel like I've made any great concessions catering to that chart. I guess it happening so so quickly and so dramatically uh, also kind of makes it easier, doesn't it? It sort of happens overnight, and re regardless of whether or not you're ready for it, uh, it comes and it goes, and uh, you're, you're sort of past that hurdle. You're referring to Nine Inch Nails' stellar climb to stardom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, it may appear to have happened overnight, but um, Pretty Hate Machine came out and the first album, and it took about two and a half years before we were on Lollapalooza and started becoming some band that people have heard of. Mm -hmm. And it was one step at a time when that record came out. Radio said, no, we can't play anything on this. MTV said, no, we're not going to play anything on this. And it was a real gradual thing. Mm -hmm. Booking agencies didn't want to book us. T-shirt companies didn't want to do our business. We got on a tour and we opened for a lot of bands and we just kept touring and touring and touring and I think through that the door started to open and pretty soon some alternative radio stations played a track and that went on to be their top requested track and then eventually MTV took a gamble and played a little bit. And it was... So, I guess in the scope of things, yeah, Nine Snails is way bigger than I ever thought we'd be a lot sooner than we ever thought. I ever thought. Mm -hmm. ever. But it wasn't like the first record came out and bang, we're top of the charts. Mm -hmm. And it's been, you know, I'm going for about five years on this. So. And you describe a, a rather circuit, circuitous, uh, laborious process during which time you must have, uh, well, in the back of your mind, had been hoping for some sort of a big breakthrough. Uh, that, that was not the case? Well, I, I, when you start, when you put a record out and you start touring and then you realize, what am I doing? Well, I, I guess I'm promoting my band, you know, and I'm, you want people to hear it. You don't, you don't ever think that a lot of people are ever going to hear it, but then suddenly they do, and then you think, is this what I wanted to do? I, I guess I've been working towards making a good record, putting the record out, hopefully people buy it do a tour to promote your record and then people start to buy it and a lot of people buy it and well I guess that's what it's all about you know, it seems like such an obvious thing but you don't I don't know if that answered the question or not or it, 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 yeah it, it does well what it sounds like is a, is a man on the path to uh, uh, a lengthy and a fruitful career as a musician Do you, have you ever thought of this as a career or has it always been just uh, the pursuit of fun and happiness no, I've, I've always looked at it as a career. I mean, and not a career in the sense of something I'll be making my living off for, you know. That is the reality of it, but that's never why I've got into music, and that's not why I've started my nail. But, I mean, it is nice to be paid for what you do as for a change. Uh, and I'm not complaining about that. Mm -hmm. But, um, 
because this is what I do best. So that's what I want to do, and it's the thing that it gives me happiness to do it. But I, I never looked at it as a casual, just kind of fuck around, see what happens thing. So it's always pretty, pretty serious endeavor. Mm -hmm. In uh, an interview with uh, Musician Magazine, you were talking about uh, not having a, a, a life because of uh, all that's transpired, that you've had to become a sort of a music creation performance machine. Um, what exactly has uh, uh, fame and, and success cost you? Well, I, I miss a time when I had time to just do things, you know, to, and when I say do things, I mean in the sense of, it's my own lack of being able to do a lot of things at once. When I start working on Nine Snails type things, it, all my time and creativity goes to that. And it's hard to maintain any sense of formality when you're in a studio 14, 16 hours a day, every day for two years. And you, and and that's not that exaggerated from the truth. Mm. Um, it's hard to maintain friendships, and relationships, and um, um, it's a very isolating experience. Mm -hmm. And when as soon as you get done with that, then you're rehearsing for a tour, and then you go on a tour, and then you're on a tour for a year and a half. And I'm not complaining, and I, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything but at the same token um, it makes you appreciate things that you would have taken for granted before hmm. have you always been a, a more sociable person or a more sol solitary uh, loner um, I'll, I'll choose the loner mm -hmm. uh, category I, I, I don't know I just never felt that comfortable around people that much so sequestering. Not to say I'm totally mm -hmm. reclusive, but I just um, I think I tend to be less social. Mm -hmm. So the the prospect of sequestering yourself away in the studio is not that terribly repulsive to you. You actually, I guess, kind of like to get away. Sometimes, but um, I could probably get that out of my system in a month for a few years. And it it becomes kind of a prison that you make for yourself, mm -hmm. in a sense. I mean, I'm being overly dramatic, but it's um, it you, you reach a point where you, I reach a point where I've had enough. You know, I'm ready to go on tour, and I'm ready to be around people now. For one, there's a, a feeling from your music of, of uh, sort of an intense feeling that the person behind it, i.e. yourself, is devoted to the process of making music for his own, to, to suit his own ends, for his own purposes. Do you ever think about the, the, the audience, the, the, the fans, when you're uh, creating your music? Um, I try not to, so that I don't find myself catering to what I think people expect me to do. But it does creep in occasionally. And on this record, there's a couple times where I had to catch myself from uh, being too concerned about what an unknown fan might think of, you know, this particular song or that particular song. And I think that uh, there has to be an element of doing it for yourself so that you are happy with what you do rather than be catering to someone else, what you think someone else wants you to do. I think better art is made through pleasing yourself and hopefully not becoming too self-indulgent in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that you can be um, objective enough to know where to draw the line? Do you ever, do you ever feel like uh, that y you need an extra sounding board or, or, or somebody to say bounce ideas off of to uh, to keep things in perspective? I definitely do. And I, I use usually producers in that capacity. Mm -hmm. And I have a I have a little uh, group of four or five people that are close to me that um, 
I definitely send everything through them before it goes out. What sort of people are they? Um, just people I've known that I know truly understand what Nine Inch Nails is about and won't just say, hey, this is cool because they don't want to bum me out, you know. And if something sucks, they'll tell me it sucks. And if something's great, they'll say it's great. You know? mm -hmm. And the bullshit detector club. And I need that. I think everybody needs that. Or mm -hmm. it's become... I mean, it's impossible to be objective in your own material when you've written it, you've recorded it, you've played every note on it, you've listened to it 10,000 times, you've mixed it, and then try to listen to it and pretend it's the first time you've heard it. You know, you just can't do that. Mm -hmm. The uh, average Nine Inch Nails fan seems so much more devoted uh, to your music than, uh, say, the, the other average fan. Um, well, that may be kind of a biased way of looking at it, but uh, there have been tales about how, you know, one woman was, uh, I guess, con convinced herself to believe that, that, that she wanted uh, to marry you or some guy wrote you a letter in blood or th there are various anecdotes. Um, do you think that the, uh, the the followers of the band are, are that much different from uh, the, the rest of the mainstream folks out there? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what kind of fans other bands get that but I, it, it's flattering in a sense that I would hope the reason that that is is maybe it means something being said in my music that strikes a chord of familiarity or something that someone can relate to, perhaps more so than a generic pop song about riding a car hanging out with girls or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't comment on that with any sort of um, authority, but um, maybe it's because there's a lot of negative issues addressed that, you know, some people really relate to it, other people don't at all. Mm -hmm. you know, I know that I could, stuff I used to like and could relate to growing up that really meant something it was usually stuff that had a darker edge to it or something that made me feel like other people felt like I do and I'm not the only person in the world who feels mm, mm. Yeah, so maybe what, what your music does is it's, it, it sort of unites the, uh, the more solitary souls of the world yeah, maybe you know, that sounds like a public service enough <laughs> <you know. laughs> does ha, 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 I guess there's a certain satisfaction involved in that, but th does it ever scare you as well? Um, it gets creepy sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know? Like I know, I've shared myself in a way that I'm not 100% comfortable, although I am 100% responsible for. And I don't know. Sometimes I feel like I've let too much too much out. You know, and then. It's not a persona that I've created. It's me. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Do you think your fans ask a lot of you? I wouldn't. I ask a lot of me mm -hmm. in terms of the type of music I've found, the kind of performance I aim to put on. But, um... I don't know. I, 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 I haven't been around them enough lately to tell you if that's the case or not. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you have opened before for, what, Peter Murphy and for Guns N' Roses, right? She's Mary Chain, Peter Murphy, technically Guns N' Roses. Mm -hmm. We did the Lollapalooza with Chain's Addiction. Mm -hmm. and it says here that, according to what you said before, there, there were times when you were opening for other acts that... Uh, you sense a certain uh, animosity from the crowd. Well, it's yeah. I mean, that that's happened. I mean, ask any band that's open for another band. Mm -hmm. There's bound to be a moment when you're met with apathy because everybody's there to see the other band, mm -hmm. and they just have to sit through you to get to that other band. So that's just sort of a, a something any opening act goes through. Uh, uh, I know we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know that every band has done that, but I, I would think that. There's been an element of that, but 
that was kind of a, a learning point with us playing live where we realized that there's different ways you can interact with the audience. And sometimes it's not one big happy family singing along the choruses together, but <coughs> it's us attacking the audience sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that, when we kind of discovered that, when we reached the point, I think we were opening for Peter Murphy. And I like Peter Murphy a lot, actually, and he's a really nice guy. But sometimes his audiences, I wanted to just climb out and start punching people. Just this elitism, bullshit attitude. We're here to see Peter and we hate you, kind of thing. <laughs> and it just became frustrating after 10 shows of seeing that. And we just started attacking the audience and uh, making a very confrontational show. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, everyone liked us. <laughs> and I realized that it became entertaining. And they were scared. They didn't know what but then It became entertaining. It became not entertaining, but it became uh, new life was breathed into a show. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, there was a give and take on stage, and there was an interchange between the audience and the band. Mm. So do, do you which had been sadly lacking. Mm -hmm. Like, we just put out and nothing comes back. It's all just absorbed or ignored. Suddenly, when, when we wanted to kill the audience, then they started liking us. Have, that you, one out. Mm -hmm. Have you applied that same dynamic, though, to, uh, to your own shows when you're the, yeah. the headline? Well, that kind of scarred us. And then we... Uh, it absolutely has become an element. I'm not saying that every time you go on stage, you want to beat people up. Mm -hmm. But there's times when those things happen. And the live performance for us becomes a very volatile hour and a half. Mm -hmm. Things tend to happen. When you say, like, you start to kill an audience, what exactly do you do? How does your performance change? Well... When we first started touring way back when, we kind of went out with this wide-eyed approach of, look, we just want to, we're just trying to get our message across, and we're meaning what we're saying, we're trying to play these songs as well as we can, and, you know, hopefully you'll get it. And that turned into, after a while, kind of a fuck you, pay attention or we're going to perhaps spit in your eyes or dump a beer on your head or throw a mic stand at you or dive in the crowd and ruin your perfect haircut <laughs> or any number of things, you know, or just verbally assault you or stare at you like we hate you because we do. And um, suddenly people paid attention. I think our performances got more violent and more aggressive because there was a newfound anger and some of the lyrics of the songs and the attitudes of the songs which were angry in one level became angry in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think people could sense there was, it wasn't fake, you know, it wasn't posing that we're mad just because that's what we're supposed to do. There was a... I don't know. It, it, it worked somehow. Mm -hmm. but, uh, hostility has always been a, a major element in your music, right? I guess so, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you were sort of given an opportunity to, to really uh, go pedal to the metal and, and let that uh, manifest itself uh, in a more sort of naked form. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, the live show evolved in a way I didn't expect it to, but in a great way, I thought. I didn't know that it would do that, but when it did, I was I was pleased in a way I didn't, you know, I was very pleased that it did that. Actually, the, the interviewer in, in one of the questions here asked something rather uh, cryptic, uh, he says, has, has the music been stripped of all elements but hostility? I don't think so. 
I don't think on the new album. Mm-hmm. Unbroken, yes. All I wa- all I wanted to do on Broken was make something that was hard to listen to and it hurt your head, made you mad, and it was desperate. With Sun, uh, Downward Spiral, I think there's an element of hostility, but there's a lot more vulnerability and uh, different emotions and stress. So and pure hostility. Mm-hmm. So, so Broken was made completely out of spite then? Broken was a, a time that was pretty unpleasant when mm-hmm. we'd gone from being a tiny little band to a fairly big band and everything I'd worked for we'd kind of gotten unexpectedly. But the record label that we were on was so awful and doing everything we could to kind of ruin things that we knew we couldn't make another record. And then I learned the ugly side of the music business, which is it's set up to basically benefit everyone except the artist. And our only option at that time was to um, start a lawsuit and try to get off, which would have taken a couple of years, which would pretty much effectively destroy Don and Janelle. And it was that feeling of working your whole life to get something finally starting to get it, but somebody else is taking it away. And that was what was kind of going on at that time. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things. Mm-hmm. Plus, just generally being freaked out from touring for two and a half years on a pretty hate machine. Hmm. So, um, th- uh, so it was broken sort of a cathartic experience? Did you get some of the uh, the bad feelings out of your out of your system with that album? Yeah, and surprisingly then we found ourselves on a good record label with total creative freedom. And that's where Downward Spiral starts up, kind of in the aftermath of Broken. And I think they work together as, a, as two records pretty well, hmm. unexpectedly. Before moving on here, there was a question about the type of person you are, and it, it goes back, I guess, to your uh, to school days when it says you were brought up in, in sort of a country town with not a heck of a lot in it. And uh, I guess it, it says the the jock speed up on you. Okay. I haven't heard that one. But, uh. <laughs> well, I, I guess there was an exaggeration somewhere along the line. Um, what what was uh, life like back in your in your pre uh, musician days? Well, I've always been a musician, but before I was ever making any money doing it. Um, it just small town USA. That's mm-hmm. where I grew up. I was there until I was 18 years old. Mm-hmm. You know, and I wanted to get out of there. And did I had enough trees and boring, nothing going on situations. Mm-hmm. And um, I wanted to get to where things were happening and just have some sort of life of working at a gas station. And uh, jocks didn't beat up on me. I wasn't a jock at school, but I, I was terrified by them. I find them interesting enough to want to hang out with them. And I still don't. Yeah. I didn't really fit into any group. Well, so you were you were a pretty much a loner back then. Well, to some degree. But was was music sort of a light at the end of the tunnel or a, a, a beacon in the offing? It's just something I thought that I was pretty good at, or better than other things at. And um, I found enjoyment through doing it, and I didn't need other people to do it. And I mean, that could be sitting down and playing something on the piano. I, I found a real sense of beauty there. And... As I matured, I realized that it was a pretty powerful means of communicating with people, if you could do it well. Mm. But I didn't know I could do it well. Mm-hmm. So rather than find out, I wasted a lot of time kind of not wanting to find out that, you know, what if I can't write music? Yeah. What if I think I can, but I want to sit down to do it. I'm stuck. And uh, 
a lot of procrastination and a lot of soul searching led me to the point where I decided well, I was going to stop everything else and see if I can do this or quit fooling myself I think I can and as I started doing that and this was about 1988 um, I started working on songs that would eventually be the hate machine um, the first album uh, I went through the painful but rewarding experience of thinking that I do like what I'm doing mm -hmm. and I can do this and that my life came into focus <laughs> obviously before learning that you could uh, communicate powerfully as a musician you must have looked up to certain musicians uh, who had that same sort of uh, ability who did you see as your role models or mentors? I'd say as a as a role model in terms of not stylistically, but being able to do everything. Uh, I was really into Prince, and I really was into the fact that he could do everything himself. Who's, I'm sorry, who was that? Prince. A Prince. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, not saying that's my only influence, but it was an influence. Mm -hmm. And realize that my influences are fairly mainstream because of where I grew up. I didn't have access to a lot of really underground stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I liked a lot of fairly uninteresting, in retrospect, bands, you know, from Kiss to Pink Floyd to Queen. Not exactly cutting edge stuff, but mm -hmm. that was um, uh, it was some element was banned. Mm -hmm. Cor correct me if I'm wrong here, but I, I guess you, you always had the desire to be able to create the music on your own, as opposed to having a group of people to create music with. No, not really. But there was a point when I think when I realized I couldn't find the right band of musicians at the inception of Nine Inch Nails. That's when someone like Prince gave me the kind of um, incentive that, hey, someone has done themselves, maybe I could do it myself. It was never a goal to always be able to do this by myself, do everything. Mm -hmm. That wasn't it at all. It just, I was living in Cleveland, Ohio at the time, which is not exactly the hotbed of um, <laughs> forward-thinking musical idea. <laughs> so, it's like, I couldn't find anybody that with a similar kind of outlook uh -huh. wasn't interested in, or that was interested in what I was interested in. After quite a bit of time of just treading water, I realized I might as well just do this. One. And uh, it then started to become fun. Mm. You know, in, in a weird way. And I still aspire for Nice Nails to become more of a collaborative thing mm -hmm. over time. But I'm trying to approach that with the, the right mindset where it happens great, but I'm not going to put an ad in the paper and say, join my band and let's become a democracy you know, mm -hmm. at this day. I, I recall reading, though, that you're pretty much a slave driver when, when, you, when you first hire people. Well, I mean, the context I've hired people in is playing a live show. So uh, I have to watch the people that I get that they understand initially what the band's about. Like, I could get a great guitar player, and if they didn't understand the capacity of the band, they may start soloing through every song, you know, which is inappropriate for what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that the people I have performing my music understand what the vibe of it is. And it usually happens. If they don't know it before they get into it, with a few discussions and a few rehearsals, they start to understand. Oh, I see. It's not about playing the right notes. It's about having the right act. Mm -hmm. understanding that Nine Inch Nails music is not about incredible musicianship and about 
amazing solo, great virtuoso drumming. It's about the attitude and spirit. And I think a lot of accomplished musicians, that's a difficult concept to grasp, although it seems obvious. It's hard sometimes when you're really good at playing an instrument to understand that it's a lot more powerful to not play it at times. Mm -hmm. And to, when you speak, have something to say rather than just talk all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty heavy-handed until I feel that the people I'm working with we're all in sync, and we are thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that happens, and then I loosen the reins. And once people understand the plot of the film, then mm -hmm. act in it, you know, mm -hmm. what you need to do. And if I didn't respect those people, I wouldn't have hired them in the first place. You always refer to the uh, refer to Nine Inch Nails collectively, but I mean, obviously, it's it's. Ba I think it's just my split personalities. You know? I, I always say we, but. The why I say that. Yeah. It's something that hides, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's this, always this, uh, this issue of labeling. Uh, you know, labeling your, your music as an industrial metal, I guess, is sort of a, a convenience of, of critics or, or, or CD shops. Um, is, is there any validity to, validity to that, to, to grouping your Nine Inch Nails with Ministry or, or Skinny Puppy or whatever? Um, a word on labeling. I'm I'm incredibly uninterested in it because it the media needs to do that. Reason I don't know why, but I think they feel better once it's categorized, then it's understandable and it's definable. And I don't think that we define anything. Um, I know we get called industrial. Um, I think there's elements of you know what in today's scene is called industrial. Um, absolutely, but I don't by any means I wouldn't recommend to somebody to listen to Nine Inch Nails because that defines what industrial music is by no means. So I think that's the case. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to do that. I think some bands go out of their way to try to define that we are this. Look, here's what we are. Here's a whole album of this. This is what we are. I'm not interested in it. And I'm more interested in um, bastardizing genres than I am trying to define what they are. And ultimately, I'm just interested in making music that I think is interesting more than I am worried about what chart we show up on or what magazine will you know, call us metal so we can do this. I don't really care. You know. I listen to some metal. I like some, some metal. I listen to some noise bands and I like that too. I listen to old Pink Floyd records and I like that too. You know, and I'm not that interested in you know, being a dead. I think you get my point. Mm -hmm. This may be venturing into the realm of the trivial, but uh, what's behind the uh, the name Le Pig? Um, it was a kind of a bad taste joke because of the all too often mentioned stay in the Sharon Tate house. <laughs> um, it was kind of a, a venture into bad taste. And, you know, that was what was written on the door in blood. So. Mm -hmm. So it was just, just your, your sort of inside joke then? Yes. Okay. okay. And admittedly in bad days. <laughs> <laughs> um, there seems to be a, a major theme of control uh, in your music. Um, control that is uh, controlled by like uh, our social structures or the idea of a, uh, 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 oppression uh, carried out through control. And the, the anger that, that's directed toward that is that is that a valid observation? It is, and that is an element of what's in some of the music. Mm -hmm. Well, what is what is this guy getting at? I'm a little bit confused. Say it again. 
the the idea of your your uh, expressing anger towards uh, oppression that's carried out uh, by means of control, societal control, so social control. I think there's a lot of element control on particularly the last record down spiral of could be control um, in, from religious factors, governmental factors, um, buying into the belief that you're part of a machine that you should just do what you're supposed to do and not think about why you exist other than just to do your job and don't kill anybody and behave yourself. Um, and the lies that are fed to you and the oppression of your own expression of individuality through that. There's control and in interpersonal relationship uh, issues being dealt with. Um, control of... Um, oops, lost my train of thought. Um, well, there's, there's two elements of control, or more, actually. But I, I don't know why the thing keeps coming up, except that it comes up. You know, I'm, things make me mad, and those are the things I tend to write about. So you see, upset me for some reason. So, 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 so you tend to, tend to lament control as, a, as a look at, see it in nothing but a negative light, as opposed to uh, appreciating uh, any sort of benefits of control. Um, that that's fair comment. Um, what would be a what would be a, a positive aspect? A positive aspect of control? Yeah. Well, pe keeping uh, people from, say, hurting each other, or, say, right. uh, maintaining... Well, when you say, like, you know, it, it, control is, is the opposite of chaos. I guess I'm more interested in chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, in the conservative America. Um, which may not appear as that conservative foreign eyes, but mm -hmm. new wave of um, right wing and fundamentalist oriented people being able to see you like someone else has the right to be able to say what you can and cannot think or see or express as if they somehow have the, the right or the divine knowledge to be able to dictate that. Uh, there's those elements. I'm not in a highly analytical mood right now. <laughs> okay. I think we're, we're, we're venturing out of the end. No, let's, let's get things back into perspective here. There's a question on what you find stimulating in day-to-day -day life aside from music. What stimulates you? Because uh, this, this ties in with the, uh, the video for happiness in slavery. Um, yeah. I, I, I haven't personally seen this. I'm not aware of what, it, what it's about, but he says he doesn't, he, he wonders where you get the, the inspiration or ideas for something like that. Uh, from, from what sources do you, uh, do you derive stimulation other than music? Well, I'm trying to remember back to when there was a moment when, before I, when I had time to do other things in the studio all day or be on a tour bus. Um, I've been pretty smothered in the whole aspect. Being Nine Inch Nails the last couple of years, and I haven't had very much time to do anything I really enjoy doing, whatever that is, mm -hmm. these days. Um, I'm interested in technology. I'm a hobbyist of computers and technology and gadgetry and... Um, that sort of thing, whether that goes to software, to video games, whatever. To um, an interest and fascination with film and movies, and in particular horror movies. Uh, I think it's another really incredibly powerful medium that 
um, I've got a lot of inspiration from films. I think that's partially due to the fact that um, when I'm not in a situation where there's that much input coming into my life, as in sitting in the studio every day for years, where not that much goes on, except maybe your heart just fails. I mean, that's the, the level of um, input you start getting. Um, I've relied on films a lot as a two-hour escape you know, to another place. Get your brain thinking in different ways. When, when you say horror films, what kind of movies specifically are you, are you referring to? Uh, I'd say probably my favorite film would be like uh, David Cronenberg movies, or Dead Ringers in particular, which is not per se a horror film in the sense of the monster and gore, but um, dread. And I don't know. I've, I don't know why. I just I'm into being scared. I'm into science fiction. I'm into those sort of things. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you why, and my, I've gone to an analyst to figure out. Um, then when I find myself in position of trying to do a video, and I realize I can do a video about anything I want to do, um, the idea for happiness and slavery I'd come up with was to come up with a, some sort of metaphor for something, that, well, a metaphor that applied to what I was addressing in that song metaphor I chose was a man who uh, very ritualistically and systematically enters a room that straps himself into a machine that eventually is his demise, but um, the key to that working was not being this machine attack. It's a very willing procedure where he knows before he goes in there what he's going to do and does it and has a commentary for leading a life of um, listening to those people who control you once again. Mm -hmm. We're back to the control issue. Right. Uh, the word machine is mentioned a lot in the, in the lyrics. Does that uh, consistently symbolize the same thing or does it vary from context to context? Um... I think it varies to a degree. I mean, with machine, I kind of look at that in a perverted way where it's not an enemy and it's not, it could be something that's kind of scary, but at the same time, it's sexual. And it's intimate. I know that may not make any sense. Hmm. Even though what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think I mean that. <laughs> Okay, well, it's kind of tough to uh, uh, objectively analyze your lyrics, so let's let's move on here. It says it says that you um, uh, you describe the meaning of your songs to your band members uh, before w w when it comes time to showing them how to play the songs. Is that true? I can't say I sat down and analyzed every song before we got on and explained everything, but. That has happened. I mean, there are times when we'll play a song and everybody's playing the right parts and everybody's doing the right thing, except that it, it sucks. Why does it suck? And then I realize, well, the attitude is missing. And then that might lead me on to a little uh, speech about, or explanation of what I was thinking when I did it. And what what it meant and means to me. And sometimes it takes, you know, that then awakens that spirit in those guys. And they, it makes more sense. Forget the attitude and the vibe, right? So, I mean, my main concern about the live band is when you see us, that it's not a bunch of guys concerned about, you know, looking cool or playing the right thing. Conveying the spirit of what the music meant to me. I'm getting that, but I know I just talked about this before. That means more, and I think people pick up on that without consciously studying for that. But, I mean, when I see a band, I think I can tell if they're into it and they mean it, or if they're just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. And since these people weren't involved in the 
creating this music, I want to get as involved as I can when we're performing it live. This, this guy is, is dying to know what the, be the becoming means. Did you have to explain that to, your, to the band members when you first started performing it? Actually, no. We've learned it, but we haven't played it out yet. Mm -hmm. We haven't played that yet, and it's one of the ones that's not gone great live so far. Maybe it needs one of those speeches, to kick it in the gear. Mm -hmm. But um, what I was, I don't like to talk about lyrics that much. We'll talk about this one. No, at one point was my favorite song on the record. I don't think anyone's ever even mentioned it to me yet. Um, I was simply making a comparison of my inability to feel with an analogy of kind of turning into a machine kind of in a unpleasant way like um, I don't really want to be doing this but and I think imagery that I used for that was um, Japanese film Tetsuo Iron Man mm -hmm. which made a pretty big impression upon him and, um, but trying to keep it from becoming too cyberpunk in its lyric content. Mm -hmm. I think it's become quite trendy and unappealing to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, the, this guy here, when, when, he, when he first heard the Downward Spiral, he was reminded of Pink Floyd's The Wall, about somebody who'd been alienated from society and how, uh, you know, he sort of, uh, his, his, his feelings of distress are, uh, continue to grow until he sort of explodes. Um, have you ever seen that movie before? Yeah, and that, that album is one of my favorite records of all time, and I'm sure I'm ripping it off to some degree. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought the movie was really good, too. Mm -hmm. really, really made an impact on me when I was growing up heard that record. That one of the biggest, I'd say, influences or uh, not nothing else of Pink Floyd really struck me that much, but that record, at the time I was in my life when I heard it, was one of those records that I really related to. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what Roger Waters was thinking. And I don't really care, you know, but to me it provided the soundtrack certain moments of my life. Hmm. So, so I guess there is sort of a, a common chord in music that sort of uh, goes beyond, transcends uh, logical thought and, and, and just hits straight to the heart. That's, I think that, and that's kind of what I was hinting at earlier when I realized it was power, it's a powerful way to communicate. It's not always literal. It's just really, that's why I don't like to talk about lyrics because, um, it doesn't matter what I was thinking, you know. What matters is to the person that cares enough to listen to it and maybe think about what's being said, what they read into it is what matters. You know, it doesn't matter that I was talking about a relationship I had or God or anything else. And um, I think it kind of ruins the illusion or spoils it. I remember reading when I was a kid. I liked some band, and I can't remember who it was. Some song I thought was really cool. In an interview, the guy was saying, you know, I'm so tired of people thinking it's about that. It's not about that. I wrote it about this. I had thought it was about what he wasn't about. And it just, at that moment, kind of made me feel stupid, and it ruined the song for me. I didn't want to, you know. Do you remember what song that was? No, I can't remember what band it was. Mm. But I remember reading that and it pissing me off. But I thought, you know, if I ever write a song, I'm not going to tell anybody. What. <laughs> I, I think there's, I think there's a truth there. There's no need for me to explain. You know. Mm. Plus, it's embarrassing usually too. Yeah, it makes a good excuse to not do it. 
there's a two-sided question here. What, when do you feel your greatest joy right now? At the moment, um, playing a show when it's working, right after a show, when like, the pressure's off. It's, uh, when I'm in the studio, that feeling comes when the song is done. I don't like writing that much. Um, I don't... If I was having a great day, I don't think I'd decide to go and write a song. I find it a fairly painful and very difficult process. Um, but I get a real sense of satisfaction when I feel that I've done something that is good and it's done and I feel like I've accomplished something, you know? Does anything ever move you to tears? Yeah. I don't, I, I, I feel that way when I see films and I get the goosebumps feeling from music a lot and I don't know if there are other people get that really but there's usually a moment there's a part in the song that's so powerful that you just get that chill up your spine that you can't control that you can't predict when that's going to happen my same song three times it doesn't happen the middle time but it does the first time you know? um, and I do I don't know if it's my own chemical imbalance but you know I cry sometimes maybe it's why I cry Wait. except I'm just so bummed out about everything mm -hmm. your, your own situation no, I'm, I was trying to be sarcastic there. <laughs> Everybody, uh, every time I do an interview, ask me if I'm going to okay. kill myself and how depressed I am. Well, Trent, coming from you, I mean, a lot of people assume just because you sort of cry yourself to sleep at night. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I realized a long time ago that the way I'm perceived in the media and the way the media wants to view me through the music that I've made and who I really am. There's common ground, but there's a lot of different things. And rather than talk to him blue in the face, to try to say, no, no, I, believe, I have a sense of humor. I have fun sometimes, you know. And I don't care enough to try to combat that. So the way I'm perceived in the media, I'm not, I'm not that worried about if it's accurate or not, because it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Most people I'm not ever going to know anyway. So right. It's, uh, I'm not that comfortable with the media side of making music. You know, I like making music. I like touring. And, you know, I'm not that concerned about, I'm not that interested in the celebrity aspect of it and, and talking about how I grew up and all that kind of shit. Mm hmm trying to forget that myself. It's almost kind of like a that. Somebody I've never met in there. So, uh, jocks beat you up in high school. <laughs> um, it's almost and kind of a natural balance. for a minute, like, oh, you must have read an interview where I must have said something. Like, that, that gets kind of weird. You know, I don't know anything about you. Uh -huh. Well, it, uh, it, it must be kind of like a, a natural balance, though. I mean, if, if it were just all the uh, sweetness and light and making your music and enjoying your audience so that would be too good so uh, I guess God has put uh, yeah we wouldn't want to have any fun while we're doing this yeah we, God has to put somebody on, on this earth to, to keep things in order <laughs> so, there was that's a, why God created interviews <laughs> God created interviews a couple more questions and I'm out of here um, Henry Rollins said something about uh, uh, continuing to do rock and roll in order to get all the anger and angst out of his system because if he didn't have rock and roll to do that it would, it, he would be driven to uh, insanity uh, and it, in that sense he doesn't really think, think about or care what the audience uh, how the audience responds uh, do you can you identify with that perspective well 
just for the record, I think Henry Rollins is a pretentious fuckhead. <laughs> um, Why is that? You can quote me on that. Uh-huh. We did that tour of Lollapalooza with him. I, I saw a glimpse into his true uh, personality. Um, but I, I don't believe he means that, but what he's saying, I think there's some validity to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's a bit overly dramatic in the way he's phrased that. But, um, um, so there. Hmm. Okay, so there. Um, I'd hate to say I agree with anything Henry Rollins has to say. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you think that the degree of success that you have achieved owes somewhat to your music taking on sort of a, a pop-like character, an easy-to-listen-to pop sort of characteristic? Um, yeah. I think that... Uh, I think that... Well, I just, just said a big thing about this, but I believe that was the interview I just did before this. So the point of being redundant... Um, I like the idea of um, flirting with accessibility. And I think just through instinct, I always approach writing a song with a chorus and some element of melody and aspiring to have a hook in it or aspiring to have something that sticks in your head. And then through the arrangement of it, it usually gets taken into where it's unplayable on a radio or it loses what could be bigger commercial appeal, I guess. But get back on track. I I like the idea of having something that um, people there's something to grab onto. And I think it's easy to make a record that's all noise. That is just art. Here it is. Check it out. It's art. If you don't get it, you don't get it. But to have something that's sonically challenging and challenging artistically, but also has something in it that you can grab onto, something that uh, might stick in your head unexpectedly. And it might be 10 layers down, and it might not be the first thing you hear, but there is some reward in there if you make it through to it. Uh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't know if that answered the question at yeah, all. Yeah, that did. Uh, subject just got to get a couple more in here, and then I'm out of here. The, the, the halo numbers, what do those mean? Um, it's just our own cataloging system. For those that might be interested, everything's been chronologically numbered from the first 12-inch to downward spiral right now. Mm-hmm. Just a little arty thing to do. <laughs> Are you aware of the uh, British artist named Raymond Watts, who goes by the name of Pig? Yeah. Um, I don't know why this question is here, but this guy just asked, uh, what do you think of him? Um, I like what he does a lot, actually. Um, I'm not incredibly well-versed in all that he's done, but um, what is going on? making the wind. Oh, got it. Okay. Got a new little organizer here that's trying to keep me organized. And then uh, had an orb CD on, and that's making noise. My phone's ringing. <laughs> so I'm saying here. Okay. Um, I do. I like what he does, and... Um, I know that there's been some talk of us doing some shows together or something. Hmm, so I guess this question did make some sense after all. Yeah, I don't know how he would know that, but, um... Yeah, I, mean, I think it's cool. I met him once, actually. Mm-hmm. I saw a show when we were, he was playing. It was cool. Okay, and the, and the, the last question is, what is the plan from here on in? There are apparently two theories uh, in... Uh, uh, circulation now. One is that uh, 
you're going to go on tour, and others that you're you're still in the studio right now. Uh, we are officially on tour. We blew off a couple weeks because our drummer's sick right now. Mm -hmm. so we were supposed to be in Australia, but uh, I'm using that time, which is right now, to uh, work on uh, some remixes and some stuff that's been just waiting for me to do. And in a couple of weeks, we'll be starting our American tour, then we go to Europe. Then we come back to America, then we go, I think, to Japan at that point, which would be probably late summer. Mm -hmm. But we'll be touring for about a full year. Wow. And I'm looking forward to heading over to that part of the world, mm -hmm. where I have uh, never been yet. Mm. Great, great. All right, Trent. Well, thank you. Sorry for taking up so much of your time. And, uh, no problem. Thank you for the excellent interview.